Hello and welcome to another episode of Ozpol Explained. My name is David, your YouTube professor looking dude, and I am here to talk about preferential voting. Voting is incredibly important for influencing the government. It's not the only way that you can have your voice heard, but it is very important. It's also compulsory in Australia to vote in federal elections. So it's kind of important to learn how it works. So this video is all about how the voting system works in federal elections in Australia. It's not going to be about who to vote for because that's entirely up to you, but I will explain how the system in Australia provides you the voter with a great amount of choice and power over how your vote counts. I also explain how you cannot waste your vote. Quick note, it's both a crime and also against YouTube's terms of service to mislead voters as to how voting works. So if any of the information in this video becomes outdated, then I will simply remove it and then re-upload with new information. Also, people can have lots of questions about voting and elections, so I'm going to tell you right now, the official source of information on elections is the Australian Electoral Commission website, which you can visit at aec.gov.au. The AEC is your friend, as I keep saying. Most of the information in this video is going to be taken directly from that website because it is the official way to get this information. So let's begin. We have a system in Australia called preferential voting. What this means is that you don't just walk into a voting booth and yell, I like party A and no one else. We also have anonymous voting, so please don't yell out your vote anyway, just don't do that. It is strange. And also there is no party A. Preferential voting is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. You rank the parties from your most preferred all the way down to least preferred. It's pretty simple enough, but the way that you write down those preferences changes depending on which house you're voting in. There are two houses in Australian Parliament. There is the Senate and the House of Representatives. If you want to know about the differences between those two houses, I have a video all about that. One quick difference is the area in which members are elected from is different between the Senate and the House. The Senate is comprised of 12 members per state and two for internal territories, that is the Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory. The House of Representatives is elected based off areas of similar population size called electorates. So inner city electorates are really small in area and ones in the country are really large. They both have a similar amount of people living in them. So this means that a party can put forward multiple candidates for the Senate because there are multiple seats up during an election. Whereas in the House of Representatives, there is only one person per electorate. So one candidate per party. This means that the ballots look different for the different houses. And let's go into those differences right now. The differences. The House of Representatives is pretty simple. When you go to vote at an election, you'll have to go to a polling booth or vote by mail ahead of time, at which point you'll be given a green rectangular piece of paper. It will have House of Representatives written on the top and then the electorate that you're voting in. And then there's a list of boxes with names and parties next to them in a descending vertical line. They have been placed in random order. Now, the instructions will be written on the ballot and there will be volunteers who will gladly answer any questions that you have. So if you forget any of the details in this video, don't panic. You'll be fine. It'll be okay. They are there to help you. There are also a range of accessibility options like telephone voting for voters who are blind or have low vision. And you can nominate someone to assist you with the ballot. I unfortunately don't have time to get into the detail of every single possibility for how to vote in any given circumstance. So please, again, there's aec.gov.au or the AEC's YouTube channel, AEC TV. It has videos on how to vote, including ones in various indigenous languages and Auslands. Imagine if me and the AEC did a collab, and that's the dream. When will Senpai notice me? The way you vote in the House of Representatives is pretty straightforward. You number every box from one to whatever number of boxes there are. So if there are four, you number them from one to four from the order of which one you like the most to which one you like the least. If there are eight, then you number them one to eight. It's very simple. You fill in every box with a number, ta-da. 
voting. The number of boxes depends on how many political parties and independents are running in that electorate. So your friend, a suburb or three over, might have twice as many options to vote for than you. Also, quick voting note, don't put your name on it. Just don't. Voting is anonymous, so if you put your name on your ballot, it will be invalidated and not counted. This is not a school assignment, it's a ballot paper. So no identifying marks on it, just number the boxes. Voting in the Senate is a little bit more complicated, but only a little. The Senate paper is different. It's also a lot bigger, and as an added bonus, there are two different ways in which you can fill it out. Usually, elections for the House of Representatives and the Senate are at the same time. They don't have to be, but usually they are. So, when you go to a polling booth or choose to vote by mail, you will likely be handed a large white piece of paper that says Senate ballot paper, along with written instructions on how to fill it out. On the top part are a series of boxes ordered horizontally, with a party name attached to them. There is also a thick black line that divides the paper into two. Below the line are more boxes, but they're in vertically descending columns underneath those party names, only now with candidate names attached. So above the line, you'll have like one box for Labour, one box for Liberal, one box for Greens, etc, etc. One box for the We Love Penguins party, you know. But below the line, there could be six boxes for Labour, six for Liberal, three for Greens, one for We Love Penguins party, the numbers will vary. Now there are two options for filling this paper out, above the line or below the line. You must choose one of these options. Above the line, if you choose to vote above the line, you are ranking the political parties that you prefer. You fill out at least six boxes from one to six. You may enter more numbers, you could fill out the entire line, but you must do a minimum of six. This is pretty straightforward, it just means that you're like, I like this party more than this party, and you may not have an opinion about the candidates below the line. If you choose to vote below the line, you are ranking the individual candidates as you prefer. As a party can put forward more than one candidate, you might decide that you actually like one better than the other and rank them accordingly. Or you could even potentially vote for every single candidate from a party except for one. Mix and match. Do basically whatever you want. This means that a party can put forward one candidate as their star that they're hoping gets elected, which means that they'll be the one on the highest box of the column, but their second choice gets so many people preferring them over the first option that number two gets elected. Admittedly, that's unlikely, but it's possible, and Voting below the line is a way to exert as much control over your vote as you want. Multiple people are getting elected every Senate election, so you could vote for every candidate put forward by a major party and they could all get elected. Congrats! Your top five best picks are all winners. To vote below the line, you must fill out at least 12 boxes from one to 12. You can fill out every single box if you choose, but you must fill out at least 12. Because the Senate covers an entire state or territory, that means that the voter base for a party doesn't need to live in one area like the House of Representatives. This is why it's easier for minor parties to get into the Senate. They only need to reach a certain quota to get a seat. This means that a lot of parties will appear on the Senate ballot paper that you did not see on the Green House of Representatives ballot paper. And this may result in a very large paper. Like, very large. It used to be that if you voted below the line you had to fill in every single box. One time I did that and by the time that I got to the end I realised that I had doubled up on a number and had to go through the process of numbering over 70 boxes from best to worst, all over again. It was a long day. But don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. If you make a mistake on your ballot, you can just ask one of the people at the polling place to replace your paper for you. You can fill out a new one. Seriously, do ask them for help. It is okay. They won't bite. 
Fun fact, it's actually illegal for vampires to work at polling booths. I guarantee you that no vampire has ever worked a polling booth. So now you know how to fill out your ballot paper, what now? Okay, so you've decided on your preferences, but what does that actually do? Well, to explain it, let's put it into an example with voting for a minor party. Preferential voting is a system that allows you to vote for the parties that you want, even if they don't get in, and still have your vote counted. Let's say that you like a minor party and you put the number one for the House of Representatives. You still need to fill in more boxes, so you have to put someone second. And let's say for this example that you decide that it's a major party. Unfortunately, in this hypothetical example, your number one option doesn't get in, but hey, because political opinion is diverse and there are lots of options, there is no single party that gets 50% of the first preference votes. What happens next? Well, a majority still needs to be found for a winner, so the person with the lowest amount of votes is excluded, and then the second preferences are counted, and then the third, etc. This process of elimination continues until there are only two candidates left in the count and one has achieved more than 50% of the vote. So if your number one pick doesn't get elected, your second and third option and so forth could still be used to eventually determine who gets elected. For example, around 80% of Greens votes end up giving preferences to Labour. And also, similarly, a lot of One Nation votes end up getting preferences to Liberals and Nationals. So even if you're a minor party voter, your opinion on which major party is better can still affect which one gets elected. So why bother preferencing minor parties at all if it ends up going to major parties anyway? Look, okay, so the idea that all preferences go to major parties is cynical and inaccurate. Yes, the majority of seats in both House of Representatives and the Senate do go to major parties. That's why you call them major parties. But there's also some that don't. As I film this, there's the Cadders Australian Party, there's the Centre Alliance, there are a few independents, and there's the Australian Greens, all within the House of Representatives, which, as I told you earlier, does not have the best success for minor parties. And in the Senate, there's also members of One Nation and Jackie Lambie. So, voting for minor parties and independents can actually just get them in. Without preferences, people would likely be less confident voting for minor parties and thus limit their electoral success. This allows for you to have more democratic options for expressing yourself at the ballot than simply being given only one box to tick. Even if you don't think a party will win, it's still your democratic right to have your voice heard and support them. So the system basically doesn't punish you for voting for who you like. And so if you wish, you can vote for a minor party first and then preference a major party. Plus, if a party or candidate gets at least 4% of the total first preference votes in an election, they're entitled to funding from the AEC to reimburse them for electoral costs. So, even if the party you really like doesn't get in, you might get them funding that they can use for the next election and potentially do better. And if a party has a larger voting base in an electorate than other places, they may realize that they need to focus their resources in that electorate for the next election, for potentially a better chance of success. So this might be a minor party increases its chances of a seat in one particular area, or it could be that a major party realizes that support is slipping in one electorate and needs to work harder to preserve its chances of electoral success. It's not all about helping minor parties get elected, although that is a benefit, it is, you know, also beneficial to major parties. Around two thirds of electorates actually require preferences to be counted to find a winner. Admittedly, fewer than one in 10 see the leading candidate in primary votes defeated after the distribution of preferences, but that's still some of them. So preferences do actually matter. There's 151 seats in the House of Representatives as of this video, and so that could be a potential 15 seats that were changed because of preferences, and that 
could change who gets to be in power. Liberal Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull won the 2016 election by one seat, and Scott Morrison won the 2019 one by two. Labour's Julia Gillard had to deal with a hung parliament and form a coalition with three independents and one Greens member. But if any of those independents had a different political stance, it could have been Tony Abbott who formed a government in 2010. So throw away the idea that your vote could be wasted. Just fling it in the trash. If you don't vote for a major party, you might get a, a minor party or independent elected. And even if it doesn't, then the major party that you like the most might benefit from your preferences. You could also just be like, I really like this major party. I will put them number one and whoever is number two or lower, I don't really care about. That's also your choice. But that's the thing, preferential voting gives you that choice. I'm not advocating for any particular party, it's just that I'm pointing out that, you know, your preferences can influence who does or does not get elected. So it is best to think about who you like outside of just your number one preference. I had a friend who, when he turned 18, put Green's number one, and he was like, yeah, sweet. But he hadn't really researched other political parties, so he was just like, oh, One Nation sounds like a good name. I'll put that number two. And you could do that. It's your right to, to order the political parties any way you want, but he just didn't realize that those parties have very different goals, like polar opposite in a lot of instances. Preferential voting isn't just about getting minor parties elected. That is just the example that I have chosen to demonstrate effectively how this system works. It's all about giving you as much control as possible over who you vote for. The proper way to fill out your ballot is put the party you like the most as number one and then work from there. Voting doesn't need to be about who you think will win so much as who you genuinely prefer. Though if you don't have strong opinions on who you prefer, this brings us to preference deals and how to vote cards. Connected to our system of voting is the thing that we call a preference deal. This is the thing that political parties do with each other to influence preferences. The thing is that you are the one who chooses how your preferences work. You, no one else, but also, not everyone has particularly strong opinions about every single person on the ballot. And people don't always know how voting actually works, though now you do. So what parties do is they get volunteers to stand outside of polling booths and hand out how to vote cards. These cards are basically advertisements for a party and they do actually contain correct information about how to fill in a ballot. But they also come with suggestions on what order in which you should do that. The order of these suggestions can sometimes be the result of agreements between parties. For example, in 2019, the Liberals had a preference deal with Clive Palmer's United Australia Party to preference them as second on their how to vote cards over Labour and vice versa. According to the Victorian and South Australian Electoral Commission, up to 45% of Labour, Liberal and National Party voters follow how to vote cards, while minor parties are less likely to follow suggestions. So these preference deals can potentially influence the nature of who gets elected. Though, depending on who you ask, they have more or less limited influence. But again, it is entirely up to you on how you want to number those boxes. So potentially these preference deals could amount to nothing. Either way, it is best to think about who you want to vote for ahead of time. How you fill out the ballot should reflect your ideas of who belongs in government. If you don't have a strong opinion outside of who your number one preference is, feel free to take one of these how to vote cards from your preferred party. Though do note that not all parties do these things. I know that I have kind of stressed the importance of these preferences, but don't be too worried. Don't worry, don't worry. Opinions about political parties take time to develop and no one expects you to be an expert 
the moment you walk into a polling station. It's fine. Just please take time to look up the policies of the different political parties and come up with a general idea at the very least of which ones, you know, appeal to you and which ones don't. Like and follow news outlets like the ABC on Facebook and Twitter and over time you'll have read a bunch of news stories and get an idea of what politicians have been doing. You'll see how they stand on certain issues and you'll just get an opinion naturally. You'll figure it out. I believe in you. I will be making a separate video on how to figure out what political parties align with your beliefs closer to an election in the future, so subscribe and hit that notification bell. And as always, if you have any questions about how voting works in any particular given context, check out aec.gov.au. The AEC is your friend, as it is my friend as well, even if it never responds to any of my birthday party invitations. One day the AEC will know how much I love it. One day. So there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. Preferential voting is a system where you get to rank political parties from how much you like them to not like them. It allows you a lot of control over who you want to vote for and can influence who gets elected, even if your number one pick isn't the one who wins. It is a system designed to make sure that you don't waste your vote and who you vote for is entirely up to you. So please put the numbers in whatever order you feel suits you best. I hope this has helped you feel more confident and empowered when it comes to voting in an election. So thank you very much for watching. Feel free to comment down below what you would like to learn about next, share, subscribe, all those things, and feel free to support me on patreon.com, link in the description. There is also a copy of the script with citations included in the description so you can read more about what I have talked about in this video. Thank you very much and I will see you next time.